Hello. Welcome back to a Trafficking Free America podcast. My name is Jeremy. I'm the host of this podcast uh, episode. Um, and in this one, we're going to continue our uh, Advocate series, a deeper dive um, into each episode. And today we're going to be st- discussing Advocate series episode three. Um, and uh, our special guest today is Savannah. Um, you may, if you've watched episode three, you've been introduced to Savannah and her story. Where ultimately she was trafficked through her family, uh, familia uh, trafficking is what we call it, and um, and you know we get what we get to do in this uh, episode is actually hear a lot more of her story and actually how she um, came to Christ and how um, ultimately she was uh, carried out of um, her life through many years of uh, uh, through um, relationships and um, you know awareness. And she gets to kind of share that story and um, and dive deeper into that, and also give some some really good insights on maybe like what others are thinking. You know, if you watched episode three, you're probably in, in many ways it, it gives episode three, uh, you know, unlike episode one and two, give a little bit more restoration feeling. Um, hearing uh, both Savannah's and Ori's story, and 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 a lot of uh, things tying together as we have rep- kind of prepared for this episode, but um. A lot of people maybe have uh, some some thoughts toward like what is what are my next steps or how do how can I recognize things better or or what can I do um, you know they might you might still be feeling like okay a, a little overwhelmed on how to truly um, start making an impact on you know um, those who are marginalized those who are being affected by human trafficking or sexual abuse or just neglect or abuse in general. And um, Savannah gives some good insights as to um, how we can like look for that, and honestly, some some honest feedback on you may not be able to see that, you may not be able to recognize these things, but if you know how to develop relationships with someone with the intent of loving them without anything in return, a lot of cool things can happen. And we kind of touch on that in um, our last podcast episode, uh, talking with Ori. And if you haven't listened to that one, I, I would greatly. Um, encourage you to listen to our previous episode when we talk with Ori about Advocate Series Episode 2. I want to make sure I plug this in. If you haven't uh, watched the Advocate Series, if you're not really sure where to find it, go to AdvocateSeries.com and you can download all five videos for free, as well as the study guide for free. And um, you can you can watch it and become become educated yourself. You can uh, bring this into your church, bring this into your congregation. You can start a small group. You can start any group and ultimately help educate you and your friends and your family and your 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 commu- your group of influence, your community on the signs of human trafficking, what to do about human trafficking, ultimately how Christ has called us to be the hands and feet of Jesus inside this com- this 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 fight to end human trafficking. I have actually been involved in uh, being educated about human trafficking since 2017. Um, So in in making this about basically six years now, and it has taken me six years to really get to this point. And so um, I want to encourage everyone to kind of start here and continue the journey. And so, um, you know, was before we get into this episode, I want to make sure that if you haven't watched the series, you are watching the series. And if you are watching the series and you're, you're diving deeper into this podcast, I want to encourage you to just remember it's mindset first is, are we, are we, le- are we, are we going into this with the idea that Christ has called us to be here? Like what, what has Christ done for me now? How can I spread that good news through not just preaching and stuff like that, but through relationships, through love. Um, I want to make sure we all have that mindset before we even take a step into combating human trafficking, into before we take a step into really doing anything with anyone in re- any relationships, to have this mindset that um, I am here to love on this person the same way Jesus has loved on me, and we start there. And if you have that mindset, I think you'll start thinking and, and hearing a lot of ways to start combating this with your own strengths, your own skills. And so I wanted to make sure I plug that in as we're in the middle of this series to make sure we're remembering, well, this isn't just like a handbook of like, okay, do this and do this and do this and we'll end human trafficking. Come on, guys. It is first a mindset because there is no handbook for this. It's bigger than that. But, but God's bigger than anything. And so I want to make sure that, um, we have this idea in mind that God is going to win. Jesus will win. (laughs) So we're not worried about losing here. We're just here to be the hands and feet of Jesus 
until Jesus ultimately says, okay, game over, I win. And I want us to remember that as we go into this. Um, so without further ado, let's get into our interview with Savannah. And I think you're really going to be blessed and educated and um, inspired by this. Well, hey, Savannah, uh, thank you for being here and uh, doing this uh, podcast episode with us. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Now, the, some audience members not, may not know who you are. Uh, if they've watched episode three, they've seen, uh, they've been able to uh, see and uh, watch your, your the story that you share and advocate. But um, go ahead and let us know, like, you know, who are you? Uh, why? why um, how, how did you get introduced to us and all that jazz? Yeah, I am a survivor of familial human trafficking um, in Central Florida. I grew up here, and I now share my story to raise awareness of what's happening and to try to make a difference and be the advocate that I needed when I was younger and try to help put things in place that could have helped me when I was being trafficked. And I now um, do a lot of public speaking and do a lot of work with legislatures to try to make changes, get laws put in place in Florida. And um, I am on the board of directors of Florida Alliance to End Human Trafficking. What what got you connected at all these different circles? Like, um, you, you know, I know that you shared in your story that like you, you didn't even know what really you, what human trafficking truly was, and and then you realized you were being trafficked. Like, what what actually got you then connected with helping uh, change legislation and helping you getting all these groups and stuff like that? Well, I went to a Human Trafficking Awareness Day, which is when I learned what human trafficking was and that I was, um, that the things that happened to me were human trafficking. And um, it started with talking to the people that organized that first event that I went to. And, um, but then after that, like, I didn't plan to get involved with anything because I didn't want to share my story. I didn't want people to know what I had been through. Um, but then it was just being introduced to another person and then them asking me to do something. And then I began just finding my voice and speaking and then opportunities just started coming. And I saw how my story was impacting different things. And whenever there's been opportunities to share my story to anybody, like I take it if I can, just because I want to raise as much awareness as I can. So it's just pretty much all been word of mouth, um, meeting different people. And it's just gone from there. When it comes to like how you're trying to, uh, you know, like you keep saying, you're, you're trying to help raise awareness and, and, and help lay, um, change legislation. And it seems, it seems to be like your two main things you're kind of going after it. Like, um, why, uh, in, in your opinion, why is talking about this, um, and sharing your story with more people, like why, why is that impactful um, in your opinion? I feel like it's impactful because, like I had heard about human trafficking um, before I went to this awareness day event, but it wasn't. I didn't connect it to anything that I had been through, and like I saw everything that I saw about human trafficking before was people tied up. Um, or from another country. So I didn't connect it with my situation. And it wasn't until I heard another survivor share her story that that's when I connected that that's what happened to me. And so I feel like even now with human trafficking being um, something that's talked about a lot more, and we have all these movies that are out, which is great, but I think we're still, we've be, now we've become desensitized to it. We see we know it's a thing and we know that it's happening, but we don't connect it with a real person. Um, and so I think I think the movies that are coming out are great, but I think it's also in a way hurting the reality of it because it no, people don't see it, don't connect it with a real person that it's really happening here or even like the, the lifelong effects of it that people have. Um, because once you come out of the situation, you still have to deal with everything for the rest of your life. It doesn't go away. Um, and then, like, I remember um, being in foster care. This was before I knew that I was being trafficked. I wanted to know somebody that who had 
somebody that had been through something similar to me and was doing well because I didn't think it was possible. I didn't see a future for myself. And so now I try to be that person for other people. And I've had people come forward who have never told anybody that their mother had sold them to. One was a 75 year old woman who came to me after an event I spoke at and she said that she's 75 years old and has never told anybody that her mom sold her to. And she spent her life trying to make excuses for her mom. Um, and just knowing the pain that I lived with for so long, and this lady who's much older than I am, she lived with that pain her whole life. And so I I try to bring a face to human trafficking, um, make people more aware of um, not just human trafficking, but the reality of it and how it is a lifelong journey afterwards and that type of thing. You know, I think to, for some of our listeners, and uh, they, they might be thinking to themselves, like, uh, how how would anyone try to excuse their mother for trying to sell them? Like, like uh, help us understand possibly what's po- what's what could be going on, and and maybe because I I think you experienced it too. Just like, why would we defend the person selling us, even if they related to us? Like, what what is the connection there? Yeah, like for so long, I wouldn't talk about um, what happened to me, not just because I was afraid of what would happen to me, but because I didn't want anything to happen to my mom. And so I was protecting her. But then it's also I still wanted her to be a mom to me. I wanted her to like I wanted her to want me and accept me and I, I would do anything to protect her. And so it's a lot of emotional stuff that's attached to it. Even though like my mom sold me to her drug dealer, who was my trafficker, she did, she wasn't the one selling me to each individual person. So you didn't see her as like, you didn't see her as the one doing it per se. Yeah. She wasn't the one doing it. She would, she would sell me to her trafficker, but then he would take, or not her trafficker. She would sell me to her drug dealer. Then he would take and sell me to all the other people. So in my mind, I felt like if I could just be good enough and make her want me, it would stop eventually. So you felt, um, so you felt that you were earning her love in this circumstance. Like, yeah. I get like, I, it's kind of maybe as you look back now, it's like a totally different mindset, of course. But um, I guess if you're a child in that circumstance, you're just like, you don't know what. I guess you just didn't really know what actual love was as a kid. Yeah, because, I mean, I grew up with parents who were drug addicts and alcoholics. And, like, in my mind, if I could just get her what she wanted, which was the drugs, it would be good enough. And, like, eventually it would end. I didn't really know how because I was a child. Um, But then that's also all that I knew. Yeah. this was my, like, before I started kindergarten, I was told that you don't talk about what happens at home. Everybody I knew outside of school was drug dealers and alcoholics. Um, so I didn't have any other example. Like, when I first heard your story, what broke my heart, um, and many, my heart is broken in many ways, but, like, something that, like, stuck to me is, like, because you're, you're the first person to truly um, tell me a story of familiar trafficking, um, I'd heard one other one, um, but your yours stuck to me a little bit harder because I was thinking to myself, I can know a child right now that's dealing with this, but I would not know because you know you you it was a secret in the household in that circumstance. Like, and I think maybe other viewers possibly feel that too. Like, I would do not want this happening to somebody, but how would I know that it's happening? Um, what would you say to somebody right now who's like, I, I want to make sure I don't let another child go through that and, and try to step in and so on and so forth. But with all the dynamics of that child not wanting, you know, that child wanting to defend their parent, that child wanting to make sure that the, the, the their particular family dynamics not um, messed up or something like that. Like it's a messy situation. How should, how should we approach this? I think it's, I mean, it's obviously difficult question to answer because I not a hundred percent sure like what somebody could have said or done to make me say anything. Cause like, um, 
the police were called a lot. DCF came in and asked me questions. And like, I've seen the reports as an adult from when I was a child where they asked if anybody did drugs in the home. And I would tell them no, because that's what I was told before I started kindergarten. You don't talk about what happens at home. But I think it's just in situations where you can like build a rapport with the children, um, maybe ask questions like if you have an opportunity I always think that if somebody asked me if something was happening that I'm not supposed to talk about that that would have let me know that I can talk about something but I think there's a lot more familial human trafficking than we even know because it does happen in the home and I think a lot of times it's often disguised as some form of neglect or abuse but not actual human trafficking because nobody sees that far into it. Um, yeah. But I think it's just building relationships and being a person that a child would eventually tell because it's, it's going to take time. I mean, in, in some ways, as I'm, I'm thinking about it, it's like, it, I guess one of the things that made you kind of talk about it, one of the things that made you realize some, a lot of the truth was again, hearing stories, hearing something you could identify with, um, and do you think that's in many ways of how we kind of pull the truth out of certain things is the more we talk about this, the more we actually share stories, you might influence someone who's actually dealing with it, but it hasn't come forth to say it. Do you see that as a prevention technique? Yeah. And I think kids like now in Florida, human trafficking is part of the curriculum in all grade levels. And I think that's very helpful because I mean, maybe when I was 11 or 12, if I had learned about it in school that might help me disclose earlier. Um, so I think it's good that there is the awareness, um, but then like the children need a safe person to talk to whenever they, if they, when or if they do come forward to tell somebody. Because if they tell another family member that's going to do the same thing, it's not going to do any good. Right. I mean, so that, that actually brings up a good, a uh, good point. You know, like as this, as this, um, uh, as we're trying to make sure we're, we're helping educate uh, and equip um, the church and to kind of stepping forward in this um, to not leave it to justice. Uh, it, we kind of want a personable approach to this, you know, like, I feel like the state can do many things, which is extremely important, you know, like, like putting the curriculum in, in, in the school's hands and stuff like that, which is really great. I want to talk a little bit more on that, but um, like, to me, I'm like, if, if we can get someone just in, uh, people in society as someone that can, that's a safe person that someone can approach, um, that would be extremely helpful. But how do we position ourselves as someone safe to approach? Like, cause I feel like if in that circumstance, you as a child, not knowing what you know, now you would feel unsafe to approach really anybody on multiple levels. Right. So like how, how should, how can someone um, you know, position themselves as a safe person to approach and react accordingly to, that shows trust, that shows that child is, uh, they have their best interest in mind? Well, I think it's hard because I think it's like that person is going to have to be a consistent person in their life, whether, I mean, like I'll use the example with my high school guidance counselor. Um, she was, she knew that um, I had come from foster care and she was, um, she, from the day that I met her, she was very, um, friendly and, um, let me know that she was somebody that I could come talk to if I was having a bad day or whatever. And, um, she eventually became, um, somebody that I was very close with. And she knew that more had happened to me than I told her. Um, but she never pressured me to tell her any more than I would. Um, and she just, I went to church with her. Um, I didn't like going to church at the time because I didn't know anything about God and I felt like it was boring, but I liked spending time with her. And so she just became a consistent person in my life that never pressured me to tell her any more than I was comfortable with. She would ask me questions. And I think that helped me know that she was, um, that she cared about me, but it took time before I ever talked to her. 
What? Yeah. What? Like, what? Can you give me like almost like a timeline? Like, what was it? Uh, uh, weeks, months, years? You know, it was probably um, weeks before I would tell her anything. But then it was months and years before I told her like everything that happened to me. You you did eventually tell her everything. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't until after I went to counseling. Well, I guess I was in counseling Mm -hmm. um, that, but she ended up being the first person other than my therapist that I told that about the trafficking and stuff. She's still, uh, she's still very involved in my life today. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, and, and, and so like, Give us, give me an example of that. Of like, so that was in middle school or high school that she met you, and then in high school I was fifteen. And how old are you now? I'm thirty six. So that's quite a few years of just like staying, and you know, that's that's awesome. And, and I'm I'm curious with your journey, like how did you get connected into even counseling and stuff like that? Because like I'm thinking of your of of you at fifteen, who is paying for that? Who's providing that? How how did someone get you to do that? I didn't go to counseling until um, 2013 when I was 26. It was after I was trafficked for the last time. Um, I ended up going to counseling. I had a job. Um, Thankfully, I had a job with health insurance, and I was able to go to a therapist. Um, But I only went to talk about that last event that happened. Um, and then it was in through therapy that I ended up going to a support group and then went to this human trafficking awareness day with people from the support group. And then that's when I realized that what happened to me was human trafficking. And then I started talking to my therapist about like everything from the past after that. So I'm just thinking, like kind of 11 years, you know, yeah. like, so you started that relationship with a counselor and she didn't hear your full story for 11 years. Yeah. And, you know, something that, uh, this, this, um, the advocate kind of touches on and that I know that we wanted to make sure of when we first shared this, by all means, these are not episodes in like, it's not like you watch episode one and you like, there's, it's not a lot of closure to every single episode. And I know a lot of people felt that in the, in the previous uh, episode too, of like, you're just going to feel sad, a little angry. This one has a little more hope. Um, uh, but, um, you know, I think. I think in many ways as someone who's involved or becomes involved in this, they almost feel the hopelessness as well. Like how are we ever supposed to end this? I mean, it's just absolutely nuts about what's going on. It, 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 and so you almost feel as hopeless as their survivor. Like you want, obviously want to help, but man. So like when, as someone experiencing that of, of maybe someone like your counselor, or just like 11 years of pouring into this girl and we, we had a great rapport, but I, she didn't feel safe or trust me enough to share this. Like I can easily see, I, I grew up in church, right? I could see I'm offended, right? <laughs> um, the ridiculousness of that. Right. But as we kind of prepare people to possibly become more involved and, 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 and taking on more mentorship of, 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 of people in their community, whether it be adult or child, like how can we prepare their mindset for survivors and understanding why this is hard and stuff like that? Like, how can we bring hope to that person that's actually trying to defend hope for that survivor? I think it's going to be with stories like mine <laughs> because it is, I mean, it's a long process because like, you look at just my life and I'm only one person. I didn't have any one person in my life until I met my therapist or my guidance counselor when I was 15. And like, I didn't have my own mother. I didn't have my parents. I was moved around from school to school. I went to eight different middle schools in eighth grade. Um, Then when I went to foster care, I was moved from group home to group home. So there was no consistent person. So Honestly, when I met my high school guidance counselor, I liked her and she seemed nice, but I was waiting until she wasn't there anymore um, because that had been the pattern of my life. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it takes a long time and every survivor is different. Every victim is different. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I mean, you can't take anything personal, um, but I, I mean... It's a long journey. Yeah. And 
you know, um, I'm curious to know, like, did your counselor actually, was she like educated about like the different things of human trafficking and stuff like that? Or she was, she was just caring. Yeah. She like, I met her, I think in 2001. And so human trafficking wasn't really something that was even known or talked about even in 2013 when I realized, well, I guess 2013 was the last time I was trafficked. 2014 is when I went to the Human Trafficking Awareness Day. And it, like, I think it, I had started hearing about it for a couple years before that, but it was still pretty new, mm-hmm. like a new topic. Mm-hmm. Um, so she thought there would, like, she said that she had an idea that there was more sexual abuse and stuff, but mm-hmm. she had no idea about yeah. human trafficking. So, and, and the, you know, that the, the thing, the key thing in doing uh, the first approach that I want to make sure people understand that you, like through episode three is like, if you, if you step forward with this mindset of like, I want everyone to know that they are made in the image of Christ, that they are beautiful in and out. They are valuable. They are, um, they're invaluable. They're, they are way more than any person could ever make them feel um, that, and they don't have to earn that from anybody else. They, they are already specially made and stuff. It's like, if we can lead the way and always pouring that into someone's life, how much prevention can we help just yeah. in that basic mindset? That's not even about human trafficking. That's just about like humanity and how we influence culture in a society. Like, um, did you have someone speaking into your life at all throughout your life? No, not until, not until my high school guidance counselor. I didn't have anybody in my life. No, outside of family, obviously you did, you had a very bad household, right? It, but, but like you obviously were involved in the community. You went to school. Like, I don't, did you go to church? Did, like, was it anything? I didn't go to church. I mean, I, I remember, I remember going to some like Wednesday night things with some friends here and there, but nothing like I went just because I was able to get out of the house and go. Um, I wasn't like, I didn't really understand anything. Even like when I started going to my, to church with my high school guidance counselor, part of the reason why I didn't like going was because it didn't make any sense to me. Like you talk about a God who loves you and I don't even know what love is. I don't want any, I don't want to be loved. Um, That's my mindset. And I remember um, my high school guidance counselor, she had two kids that are two and four years younger than me. So they're kind of like my siblings now. And her daughter would always tell me like that she loved me and stuff. And I remember she would get so upset because I wouldn't say it back to her Hmm. because that's not something anybody ever told me before. Like I wasn't told that growing up. So it was just odd to me. Um, so until then, like I didn't really have any other than my teachers and stuff. I didn't have a whole lot of interaction with people. Sure. And uh, I mean, uh, what for the, for the times that you did, like looking back and if someone, uh, someone's going to want to be like, okay, I don't want that to happen. And how, how do I communicate love? for someone who doesn't understand what love is, how, how, how would you say, what would you say to somebody? I mean, I know there's no black and white answer. That's what everyone wants. I think we're going to find out on this series. There's no black and white answer to any of this, uh, except for Jesus. Um, but, um, uh, it's like Christ and love is like really the only black and white answer, but there's no black and white answer of how to show that. Um, but if, if you could try to help somebody out, like what would be, what was the thing that truly spoke to you to, for you to understand what love is? Um, I mean, I don't know at the time, but like I know looking back, everything that my guidance counselor and her family did was love. Um, and I wouldn't want them to change anything because I feel like it all, like God works, worked it all together for good. Mm. Um, and I wouldn't be where I am now if they didn't, like, if they stopped loving me, I wouldn't be where I am. Where do you think we're falling short in this fight against human trafficking? As we talk about ending human trafficking and combating it ultimately, what, where do you feel like 
um, society is falling short? And maybe where do you feel like the church is falling short? I mean, kind of like you were talking about earlier, I think a lot of people hear about human trafficking and they want to get involved, but nobody is consistent enough. The programs don't last long enough. It's like we're trying to pit victims and survivors on a timeline. And if we don't accomplish what we want to in that period of time, we're done. So the church stops whatever program they're doing or a organization, they fail and end. And so there's not enough consistent resources or people um, to, to really make a difference. Do you feel like, uh, you know, we think about when I think about um, getting into and, and, you know, there's still a lot of I'm still learning. Right. I was really first introduced to this about um, seven years ago now. Yeah. Um, but uh, like. What are, are we probably focusing on one thing too much? Like, are we focusing more on victim care than we are about prevention? Are we focusing more on um, the arresting of traffickers rather than the um, uh, like figuring out how to stop buyers from buying? Like. What are we not focusing on or we're focused on too much, maybe? I think we focus a lot on awareness. And it's funny because that's one of my big things. Mm -hmm. But everybody wants to spread awareness. But and we we want to help people realize they're victims. But there's not enough for survivors. There's not enough to bring them from the, that transition from victim to survivor. Um, and like a lot of the things that are out there, like they may have help for a year, but if I look at like how long it took me, that's not enough time. What kind of things do you feel like survivors are truly needing? If you were to, I mean, again, no, no survivors is the, the same. So I don't want to. What they're truly needing? Yeah. Like, I mean, what, what, what should we start as, as, as cause you bring up a very good point. Well, even like safe houses and stuff for whether it's adults or children, I mean, I know there's a lot of adults that want help or need help, but if they smoke, which a lot of them do, they can't go to this place. Or if they've had an addiction, they can't go here. They have to go here, but this place won't take them for whatever reason. You have to fit in the perfect little box to get the resources. Yeah, something that I know that the the U.S. Institute in its early days, um, early days, um, experience with they actually opened up one of the first boys' safe homes. And I knew that when they were opening it up, um, there was a lot of discrepancy on both sides, on the LGBTQ community and the church, because it was like the states, the state said like, hey, we have a lot of boys that kind of need help, but a lot of them identify as girls. So are you cool with that being kind of a Christian organization? And they they took a step back to think about it. And they're like, uh, would I not give a safe bed to someone just because they consider themselves to be a girl? Should they continue being trafficked because they struggle with gender identity? No, that sounds ridiculous when you put it that way. Um, but you had both sides fighting in many ways. And the, to where the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community said like, hold on, we don't want you like having these people just to make them straight. Like, just, like this is their project child sort of thing. And the church was like, well, we better not tell, speak, uh, tell, uh, let them continue this sinful life. And, and it kind of came to an approach of like, hey, how about we just care? Like, so I, I bring up that to say like, because you bring up a very good point. It's almost like we take in victims to treat them as a project. Yeah. How do we change that mindset? I think we can't have any expectations for one, mm. but I'm not sure what the answer is. Sure. No, I hear you. I mean, ultimately, we shouldn't pre treat people like a project. Yeah, I think is the first step, right? I mean, if you felt like you were being treated like a project from your school counselor, you probably would have seen right through that. Yeah, like yeah. I wouldn't want anything to do with her. Yeah. I don't want to be. And that's another thing, like even with like a lot of victims don't know that they're victims and they don't want to be victims. They need help, but they don't necessarily want help. Um, and I mean, it's a it's a process. And I think unless somebody fits into the perfect box, they're not going to get the help and the services that they need, or the, it's not going to last long enough. Um, and so I think part of that is why a lot of things end 
like services, safe houses. Um, they end up not be some of them end up not being used because they don't have the perfect victims that can go there. So do you think the church struggles with supporting safe homes because of because of kind of what we're talking about right now of like you know, like uh, they don't th- th- this uh, this has to be a witness a, a conversion a you know all these things again. I like, think it might be that or maybe it's like they don't get a success story out of it right away. And so then it's done. Um, they, maybe they feel like they're not actually helping. Um, Cause a lot of survivors end up going back into human trafficking because mm. that's all that they know. That's what's familiar to them. Mm. Like coming out of it. I mean, a lot of people think that survivor or victims or survivors should be happy because they're not in that situation anymore. But that's for, I rem- like for me, Going out of it, like, I didn't want to be out of it. I wanted to be with my mom. Hmm. So I didn't want to be in foster care. I didn't want to be in a group home with people I don't know. I'd rather be with my mom. Um, So a lot of survivors and victims end up going back into human trafficking because that's what they know. That's what's comfortable to them. Even though it's bad, that's what's normal to them. For someone who is, you know, taken from their home in a sense and put into a foster care, and it could be like a... You know, I would hope, I uh, would pray that it's a good, it's a good foster home, a Christian foster home that can speak in love into their life and stuff like that. But I'm sure, yeah, again, process, like they don't want to be there. Yeah. How do you show, how would you want to encourage someone to show love and be patient with them, show consistent love for someone who doesn't want to be there? Like we experienced that in episode three of talk, Ori talking about her story. You know, she would just uh, go, uh, she said she was, she wanted to like abuse them in certain, yeah. certain ways, right? Like she would uh, uh, make them feel like crap. Um, and what spoke to her was them making, making sure that they, under, that she understood it wasn't her fault. But I feel like in many ways, the church wants to be like, well, it is somewhat your fault. It's somewhat your fault. You know, you, do, you need to take responsibility. How do we, how do we, how do we approach that? Um, in your opinion, as a, as a survivor, as someone who's, who's talked to others. And I would say like the same thing with encouraging them. Like, I remember like even my guidance counselor, she would always like, I would always say, well, nobody in my family has graduated high school. So going to school is pointless. And she would always encourage me that I don't have to be like my family. I can do well. And I think maybe like, helping people like with the foster care situation, helping them realize that the things that happen to them don't have to define them. Even if you don't even know what has happened to them. Um, Cause some people may not know. And just like helping them realize that their like the, their past does not have to determine their future. Um, just helping them believe in themselves more. As someone who um, is not letting their past define her, but rather using her past to um, really, in certain ways, I would say, um, empower or to ultimately um, speak love and truth into other people's lives. You know, how, how, um, where are you now? Let our, our viewers understand, like, where are you now in life to, to, to just let them know, like, I'm not letting my past define me. Well, I ended up being the first person from my family to graduate high school and go to college. I am now a CFO and HR director at a Christian conference center. Um, I was appointed by Attorney General Ashley Moody to the Board of Directors for Florida Alliance. And like my, I always say like, I don't let my past define me, but I always like, I want to, I feel like God is using all of the bad things that has happened to me to bring good. Like I like being able to see the good that's coming out of the horrible things that I went through and it may have been horrible for me, but now I'm able to share my experiences to help other people. And I feel like, like I don't, I remember like always wanting a different life and stuff. And now it's like, even though what I went through is horrible. I 
like I don't feel I don't feel sorry for myself or anything because I feel like it's like I would rather it be me than somebody else first of all but I like that I'm I'm able to use that to be a inspiration or hope for other people that's awesome well how did you how did you end up um experiencing christ in your life well all those trips to church with my guidance counselor (laughs) um it ended like in one i think 2009 um i i i what's the word I ended up becoming addicted to cutting myself and like self harm. Um, after watching both of my parents try to commit suicide. And Mm. so I started cutting myself and of course, back then it wasn't common like it is now. So they thought that I was trying to commit suicide. And this was when I went to foster care. So I was moved from group home to group home Mm. and I stopped cutting myself for a little while, but then, um, As I, once I got out of foster care and continued to be trafficked, um, this, like I still cut myself, um, on a regular basis, started breaking my own bones because the cutting wasn't enough. And I, like, I went through the motions in high school at church with, um, saying a prayer and thinking that I was saved. Um, but my life never changed. And it was after my pastor preached a sermon called empty plus Jesus equals full. Um, and he talked about how we try to fill our lives with different things and different addictions. And that was the first time he, or I had heard that like an addiction doesn't have to be drugs. It can be something that you try to fill your life with. Um, and so that's when I realized that the cutting was an addiction for me. And I went and met with him and told him that like, it had been 10 years and I'm still cutting myself on a regular basis. And he got me hooked up with an accountability partner and I would read scripture. She would give me scriptures to read that would encourage me and stuff. And one night I was reading, um, second Corinthians five seventeen, where it talks about if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation, the old is gone and new has come. And that's when I realized that, like I said, a prayer in high school, but I didn't mean it. Nothing in my life changed. And so I ended up surrendering my life to the Lord. And after a couple of months, I was able to stop cutting myself. And um, I've like, it's been, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have been able to go through counseling and all of that if I didn't have God in my life. That's, that's, that's an incredible story. And that's so, that's so encouraging for me to hear. And this is the first time I've heard that about you, Savannah. And, and I, that's, it's just, so, it's just the reason why it's like the, I do feel like the key to this dent in human tra- of, of, in the very least decreasing numbers, right. In the very least decreasing the purchasing and the, and the, and the, and the grooming of uh, making it hard for traffickers to groom and so on and so forth. Like, I feel like the key that's missing is the church is, is the body yeah. of Christ sharing that truth. Like, so when I first told you about the series about like how we're trying to bring the church into it, like what did you think about that as you've been trying to influence society, legislation, all that jazz? Like, what did you feel when I first told you about it? I was excited about it because even like with foster care, there was never supposed to be a foster care system. Like the church is supposed to be that. Oh man, it's preach! <laughs> I feel like I feel like we're losing a lot of kids to the foster care system. And I feel like the church could do a lot more. Foster care seems to be uh, something I think we're going to be pressing into a lot. Yeah. Hey, Savannah, thank you so much. And um, I, 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 I thank you for your bravery in this. Um, my prayer is that others have, who, who might be experiencing what you've experienced to, to come to grips about what's going on in their life, kind of like what you did. And, and I pray that you influence I pray that this influence is if, if not one thousands, um, you know, to, uh, to be like that guidance counselor and just be consistent in someone's life and just ultimately sharing someone who shares the love of Christ in someone's life in a consistent and practical and just caring way as just going to plant seeds everywhere. Yeah. Savannah, thank you for doing this and thank you for being part of this. And um, I pray that 
God keeps on using you in multiple ways. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for being with us on the Trafficking Free America podcast and um, in the season two of uh, continuing and further discussion about our Advocate series. Um, if you have not heard of or don't now know where to download our Advocate series, please go to advocateseries.com and you will find a link to ultimately access all the videos, download our study guide. All this is for free. And we also put some additional resources on that website so that you can, as you deep dive into these episodes, you can uh, access our resources to kind of get a better idea on on, on educating yourself, um, uh, getting some ideas on how you can get plugged into um, ultimately uh, combating human trafficking if you feel inspired or you feel God calling you to, to do more. The U.S. Institute Against Human Trafficking created this Advocate Series to help educate the church so that they know a little bit better of an idea of how they can react in a Christ-centered way on combating human trafficking. And one of the action steps we give is to, is to actually become an abolitionist. When I say become an abolitionist, I mean by going to usiaht.org slash abolitionist and signing up to be an abolitionist. It's our abolitionist project. It is ultimately a way for you to subscribe and receive resources. The mo every time, we, on a daily basis, we're trying to create content and find more resources and more ways to um, rally and unite uh, the church together and others together to um, combat human trafficking. And by signing up as an abolitionist, you get resources right away from us to do that. But we also ask our abolitionists to get involved in one of three ways. It is to either uh, help raise awareness. That could be anything from sharing things on social media, just continuing, uh, continually, continually talking about this with your friends and family, um, those who are, uh, you can influence in your community, possibly even taking our TFC program, our TFZ trafficking free zone program, bringing that to businesses so that they can become TFC zone, uh, trafficking free zones and, uh, may, or maybe taking this advocate series to churches or other, any group you want to, and, and helping raise awareness. Another way is to volunteer. If you want to volunteer, we have a program. We have several programs at the U.S. Institute Against Human Trafficking that you can actually um, uh, get involved in right away as a volunteer. But also, you know, this is a nationwide thing, and we are uh, continually partnering with other organizations such as safe homes, foster care agencies that are uh, in pregnancy centers, multiple places, multiple resources that are helping combat human trafficking or help it, helping the marginalized that really affect, um, you know, those who are being groomed or brought into human trafficking. And so uh, if you are, if your heart is to volunteer, if you want to spend your time doing that, we want to help get you plugged in. So by signing up as an abolitionist, and if you want to volunteer, you can actually schedule a consultation meeting with our team at the U.S. Institute Against Human Trafficking to uh, help get plugged in in the right way, like where, where you're located, as well as your time, as well as your talents and skills and heart. We help try to partner you with the right, with the right organization to uh, to start start getting involved. And the third aspect is helping raise raise funds. Um, you know, even making this advocate series is thousands of dollars. Uh, creating content and helping raise awareness on a continual basis costs a lot of money. These organizations that we're going to help you help plug you into, everyone needs funds to help make this happen. Um, we are fighting a one hundred and fifty billion dollar industry. And if we're coming in with um, with uh, pennies compared to that, it's going to be a longer haul, right? It's going to be a harder fight, and mo and it's going to take longer, and there's going to be more victims. Um, money is definitely not power, but money is a natural resource to help those who are being marginalized. This entire thing started with money, and we can combat it with good. Um, if you have a talent for raising money, I want you to help us raise money. I want you to help fundraise, whether it's giving yourself, whether it's getting others rallied around this to give to the U.S. Institute Against Human Trafficking, or it's rallying around your local organization that you know is combating human trafficking and you can help them. Ultimately, we need you to um, help raise funds. Ignoring the fact that funds are a need is ignoring the fact that people are in need. These funds will help those people. And I want you to make sure, I want to make sure you're researching. And if you want to talk to the U.S. Institute Against Human Trafficking to help make sure you're choosing a good organization that's truly putting, you know, their money where their mouth is, um, that's another thing we're trying to help too. 
We're trying to weed out those who are doing good compared to those who are maybe just, you know, exploiting the fight against human trafficking, which is also real. So guys, um, Thank you for listening to, the, to today's podcast. Again, if you're ready to get involved after watching the Advocate series, I encourage you to go to usiaht.org slash abolitionist and actually sign up. Um, and if you have not watched this Advocate series, please go to advocateseries.com and download and watch this five video series and then go and sign up to become an abolitionist because I promise you, um, you're going to feel um, pulled the, into helping in any way possible. Thank you. <laughs>